Yeah, Naomi and Greg asked me to kind of give a historical overview of the use of the global models in the operational centers. So this is a little different way of looking at the slide James showed, but it kind of shows the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and the noughties on uh, TC track forecast errors at the operational centers, the Hurricane Center and JTWC. And you know, the 70s were pretty much dominated by Clipper, really, and maybe some statistical models. The 80s saw the onset of some of the simpler NWP models, along with the statistical dynamical models. Uh, the NWP models started to move into the scene in the 90s, and the noughties were dominated by the introduction of the consensus forecasting at both centers as well. But bottom lines here, five-day forecasts now are as good as essentially three-day forecasts were in the 90s, and that's why we're making the five-day forecast now. A little historical background. It was kind of fun to put this together and take a look back at some things. Of course, this is my own personal look, so I'm sure I've omitted some things, but ironically, the first hint that the global models were going <coughs> to have some impact on tropical track forecasting came from a study that Leonard Bankston at the European Center did back in 82, where he noted intense hurricane-type vortices in the 1980 version of the ECMWF global model, which was roughly about 200 kilometer resolution at that, so at that time, and he pointed out that it hinted at the potential for a tropical cyclone forecast skill. Uh, Dick Reed went and did a sabbatical, I guess, at ECMWF in 88. He had a paper where he looked at the ECMDF, ECMWF model again on easterly waves in the uh, eastern Atlantic and off of Africa. Their model at that time was about 125 kilometer resolution. And he again came up with, this was in 85, this stuff he was looking at, August, September of 85, but he found the forecast performance was encouraging. Uh, Hall in 87 found the UK Met Office global model, which was about 200 kilometer resolution at that time, using a small set of synthetic observations. I think there were like four surface observations that they used at that time around a storm. Again, d displayed some skill in analyzing and forecasting TCs. Uh, Chris did a paper back in 89 where he ran a high resolution global model with different uh, resolutions as well as improved physics and different initial conditions and concluded that increasing rev res resolution, improving the physics, and improving the initial conditions are all going to have useful influence on track forecasts. Uh, 91, Steve Lord desc described the synthetic OBS that were first used for the assimilation of TCs into the NCEP model. Uh, Rich Jeffries and I examined the no gaps performance back in for the 1991 hurricane season. The synthetic OBS were first put into no gaps for the 1990 season. At that time, no gaps was about 165 kilometer resolution. And we found that the no gaps tracks in 91 were actually superior to the operational tracks. Uh, Julian Hemming and company described the improved synthetic OBS system, assimilation system used in the uh, Met office in 94. Uh, Kuma described the Japanese global model and its application for TC track prediction. And Liu et al. in 2000 described the vortex relocation procedure that was put into the NCEP GFS for the 2000 season. And then I had a paper where I went back and looked at the 95 and 96 performance and the 97 performance in Westpac of consensus forecasts from the operational models. So take a quick look at a timeline here of operational use. I went back and looked at Hurricane NHC's verification reports, I have all the ADEX from JTWC. And back in 92, really, was no gaps in the UK Met Office were being used at JTWC. And this is what I'm looking at is what we call, what's called early guidance, as James outlined. In 96, the Japanese global spectral model started to be used at JT. In 98, really, is when the early guidance from no gaps in the UK Met were available at uh, the Hurricane Center. And the first consensus guidance went in at JT. In 2000, the GFS started to be used by the forecasters at NHC, and the first consensus guidance went in there. 2001, the GFS started to be used out at JTWC, and JTWC began official five-day forecasts in 2001. 2003, NHC began their official five-day forecast. 
2005, the ECMWF model started to become more readily available and used at NHC, and in the following year, it started to be used at JT. So first, we'll take a look at the 72-hour forecast error, which back in the early 90s was really the long-range forecast at JT, and you can kind of see the onset of the different models. Now, this is the actual raw year-to-year -year, uh, forecast error. No gaps in the UK met were about the only game in town in the early 90s. The Japanese global spectral model appeared in 96. Here we see the GFS making it in in 2001, and the European Center model in 2006. You can see the gradual improvement of all the models, big year-to-year -year fluctuations, and uh, One reason for these year-to-year -year fluctuations is this is actually the number of verifying 72-hour forecasts for all, each of these years. And you can see that really jumps around a lot. Uh, here in the Atlantic, even down you know, around 50, I think, this past season, one of the lower ones. And 2005 and 2004 were much higher, much more like, say, a Westpac season. Also, you'll notice the activity in Westpac has been declining over the past 20 years or so. Not that this is a climate talk, but anyway. So because of this jumping around, what I did was I put together three or weighted means of all the models. It just gives a little bit smoother picture of the model improvements over the years. And so again, we can see that the global models have improved at 72 hours from the early 90s Errors up around the 300 to 350 nautical mile range, now down between 150 to 200 and some nautical miles. And again, with all the models, you can just see a steady improvement. Just for comparison here, I put in a, put in a consensus even before there was a consensus. And just like NHC, the her, JTWC started actually using the consensus forecasts around 2000, 2001, you can see the official forecasts really made a big improvement in that time frame. And another thing I wanted to take a look at is what I call forecast availability. This is what percent of the time a forecast from one of these models was available to the forecaster when they had to make a 72-hour forecast. And you can see in the early 90s, the availability percentage of the models was down around 50, 60 percent. And that's improved over the years to now at 72 hours, it's routinely up in the 90% range. So you can see the same thing with the onset of the ECMWF. When it first was available, it was hardly there, and it's getting more reliable. Uh, the Japanese, one reason their, their availability is roughly in the 70 to 80% range is they only put out the uh, tracks for the air storms in their AOR or their area of responsibility. So JTWC has to forecast for more than that. So. And in the Atlantic, similar plot. Again, you can see it's pretty jumpy looking at individual models. Uh, the season where no gaps did extremely well was essentially one storm. And uh, for that same reason, went ahead and did a weighted average, a three-year weighted average, to get a little better picture. Now, remember, the GFS started to be used in 2000. This was after the vortex relocation went in. I went ahead and put in some of the, the errors. You could see what a great improvement was made in 2000. GFS has continue, continued to improve. Uh, again, no gaps, UK met, shown improvement over the years. And again, here's consensus, what it would have been before we had it, and then it started to get used in around, what, 2000, 2001. Also, forecast availability, we aren't going quite back as far, but again, in the early or mid-90s, the forecast availability of the different models was not as good as it is, as it is today in the you know, 50 to 70% range, and now it's improved to where models tend to be available 80 to 90 percent of the time. Now, some of this can have something to do with the model itself, but it also can have to do with communications. It can have to do with uh, a lot of other things that have improved over the years. And for the Atlantic, I wanted to look at the five-day forecast error. Again, NHC 
officially began to make official five-day forecasts in 2003, but I put some stuff up here from before then. These are the actual individual years, and they're jumping around quite a bit, as you can see. But in the early 2000s, the five-day forecast errors from the models were quite a bit larger than they are. So quite a bit of improvements been made in the past 10 years. Hmm. These are the number of verifying forecasts. You can see they jump around a lot. Again, this past season, there were, I think there was about 20 for Atlantic for as opposed to 2008, which was up around 150. Here's 2004 and 2005, which were up close to 200. And you still see this little de descent in verifying forecasts in Westpac. So this is a th the three-year weighted mean, and just gives you a little smoother picture of the model improvement over the past 10 years or so for the global models and uh, the consensus and the official and the European Center model. As you can see, I think James mentioned, really had great performance these past couple of seasons and has really resulted in a further improvement to the consensus guidance. And similarly, here's the availability, which again has gone up from down the 60% range in the early part of the decade up to more of the 80-90% range now. So we wanted to take a look at what's caused this improvement of the global models. So I did a couple of studies with no gaps several years ago. Five minutes? Yeah. One, one study, what we did is we tried to uh, duplicate the ch changes that had been made to the no gaps forecast model in resolution and in the physics. Essentially, the resolution went from T79 to the T239 over the, from the early 90s to the present. And we changed from an Arakawa Schubert to an Emanuel Cumulus scheme, which had a lot of impact on the tropical track. So this period was August 14th to September 30th, 2004, a pretty active period. You can read what storms and typhoons were available. And what we found was the total model improvement ranged from about 15% at 24 hours to about 40, between 40 and 45% at uh, 120 hours. What was due to the change in resolution from T279 to 159 was most important out at four and five days, had a little impact at 24 hours. The improvement due to the physics scheme changing from the Arakawa Schubert to the Emanuel was pretty consistent at all forecast lengths, roughly in the 10 to 15% range. And we didn't notice any improvement at all when we went from T159 to T239. So the resolution increase from 79 to 159 was quite important. And from that point on, at least with no gaps, we seem to have a diminishing point of returns in terms of resolution. Then with the, essentially with the current system, current data assimilation system, we looked at the uh, impact of different observation systems, satellite observation systems. We used two periods, 2005 and 2006, essentially ran the model excluding one type of satellite observation. Again, a very active couple of periods. And now these percentages, you can't quite compare. Those other ones were, were with respect to the T79 from the early 90s. These are with respect to the current version of the system. So all satellite data has a percent improvement on TC track forecast for no gaps, ranging from about 15% at 24 hours to over 40%. The future track winds turn out to be the, the big, big player in this, up almost 25% improvement due to the future track winds from the geostationary satellites at five days. But what you see is that it seems to be additive. All of the different types of uh, impacts from the satellite data tend to add up to the total impact we saw when we just omitted all the satellite data completely from the data assimilation system. And you can see some small things. The SSMI precipital water actually has a fairly consistent impact uh, at all forecast lengths. The uh, AMSU A radiances have some impact at all forecast lengths. The scatterometer and the SSMI wind speeds and the MODIS winds up in the polar areas tend to have zero insignificant impact on the track forecast. So quickly to summarize, uh, routine operational use began in the early 90s at JT and the late 90s at NHC. The number of global models has increased from two up to four to five today, depending on the center. Uh, typical forecast errors for 72 hours 
range decreased from 300 to 400 nautical miles to 150 to 200 nautical miles, while five-day forecast error decreased from 400 to 500 nautical miles in the early 2000s to 250 to 350 nautical miles now. Uh, the increased number of models and the improvements in the models have caused improvements in the consensus forecast. And again, based on these two no gaps experiments, we found uh, the resolution uh, had a big impact on the model uh, improvement and that the feature track winds had the largest impact on the improvement in the data simulation system. So 